Greetings, friends. I welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ to this worship service. As you know by now, we've switched formats for worship this week and possibly the next uh, week too, because AJ Kantai, who we're very glad to see on this uh, Zoom worship, uh, has been providing amazing recording and video editing services to the church, but has also sadly contracted COVID-19. He and Amanda are both getting better day by day uh, and will still continue to pray for their return, but this is the medium that we have now in the midst of these times. When AJ let me know that he was sick after, uh, after our, our initial shock and concern, Brianne asked me, well, what's plan B? And I was like, AJ recording worship videos was plan B. We're up to plan C or D or M at this point. And that's true. This year has provided challenges that most previous generations of churches never had to face. And yet I'm not entirely distraught by this because you're here. We're still worshiping. And what we've learned is that God is faithful and plans A, B, C, and through the entire alphabet. So I am grateful for the faithfulness of our God and for your faithfulness too. When I announced to some of the church leaders that changes, uh, uh, the, the changes that we needed to make for this week, one of them said, I'm sure this will work out in, in such a pinch. Potluck Church always turns out better than we expect. What a very Presbyterian reflection. And that reflection, that little gem of wisdom and encouragement, came from our seminary intern, Ashlyn Stanton Henry, who I now turn worship over to as she leads us in our Advent Candle Liturgy. Ashlyn, over to you. Good morning, all. Last Sunday, we began our journey through Advent, and we lit the first candle, the candle of hope. And this morning, we light the second candle, the candle of peace. And both myself and my husband sort of centered our lives around the work of peace, and I think about it pretty often. Um, peace doesn't come easily to many people, and I know this through firsthand knowledge and you know, as a, as a social worker, I often found myself amidst the hardest, most tragic days of people's lives. You know, I'm there at the moments when people are trying to make sense of harm, trauma, tragedy, all while trying to function in their everyday tasks and responsibilities. And I know it's true for my own self, too. In times of difficulty and in transition, it seems that peace is so unattainable and nothing in me feels at peace in those moments and you know I've still been able to help people transition through those times when they're not feeling peaceful and help them to breathe to prioritize to ground themselves and I remember for myself I was in a time of transition and I was practicing these breath prayers based on the words of Jesus when calming the Sea of Galilee, calming, calming the storm over the Sea of Galilee. He goes, peace be still. And I would take in a deep breath and say peace. And as I let that out, I would say, be still. And one day while continuing this practice, I inadvertently changed the words, peace be still to pieces be still. And the slip up spoke to my condition. In the constant world of decisions, anxieties, and contingency planning, with all these things bumping recklessly around in my mind, the idea that these pieces coming to a halt was especially relieving. Now, science explains that dysregulation, like that found in anxiety or a symptom of, a symptom of anxiety, is really caused by our brains being at war with itself. Now, two different parts of the brain, the limbic system and the executive brain are vying for attention and thus control of our actions. 
And this can create all kinds of symptoms of disease throughout the body. And it impacts our spirits, impacts our minds, and of course, our bodies too. Now, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom, a word that when translated carries a connotation of wholeness. You could even ask, are you shalom? It's like asking, are you whole? And we can ask that to ourselves, we can ask it to our neighbors, even to our communities, the country, and creation. Are you whole? And we can look around this Advent season and easily conclude, no, we are not whole. If shalom means wholeness, then it must mean that something is incomplete, something must be missing. Last year, I was able to attend a local Christmas Day parade, and during the parade, it was nearly comical how many floats were renditions of a nativity scene, at least half. It seemed like every other float was Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus. Now, this is a really beloved, beloved and constant image of our Christmas season, but we often forget or overlook one of the most nuanced miracles of the nativity. And these are the polar opposites that are brought into relationship together. These pieces of our world, the nativity becomes a microcosm of shalom, of wholeness. There is something when we look on the scene that sits well within our souls. Just think. The impoverished new parents peering over the Christ child that is heaven's costliest gift. There's the juxtaposition of guests that come to visit the Christ, both these highfalutin wise men from foreign lands and lowly shepherds just from over the hill. There are barn animals acting as a welcome party, and even the cosmos render a star as a birth announcement declaring that God is with us. So, you know, angels and asses alike take part in this great picture of heaven making a home among us. Psalm 85 reminds us in similar opposites of the relationship of peace in our world. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The work of piecing our world back together is nothing short of the calling of Christmas. We are called to remember the nativity and when our world is cut up into factions and fractions and we are dismembered from each other, we must begin the work of remembering the world back together again. So who is your opposite in the grand nativity? Who are you called to seek shalom with under our stars, to seek wholeness with again? As we light the candle of peace, let us be reminded that the work of peace on earth is ours to continually remember and remember back together. Friends, let's pray together. O oh God that loves my enemy, help us to remember that your vast love is not only ours to claim. As we look upon the nativity, we are reminded that Christ brings and binds all that is together into the great story of our world. We repent of fracturing your kingdom and drawing boundaries around who is worthy of your love. We ask for a spirit of healing and reconciliation as we seek your shalom for ourselves, our neighbor, and our enemy. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Ashlyn. Uh, as I shared last week, we're, we're bucking tradition and we're singing Christmas carols all throughout Advent because Frankly, we need it. I need the, the comforting melodies of those well-known songs that sing to the presence and power of God in our midst. And judging by the number of people who reached out this past week and said, 
Thank you for the Christmas carols. I wasn't the only one that needed those comforting melodies either. So keeping your microphones muted, I encourage you to sing at home our wonderful opening hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful. And this is our opportunity for our first clunky transition. Are you ready for it? Nope, this is the wrong one. Told you, clunky transitions. I love that there is uh, now video evidence of this. Nope, wrong one. There we go. Welcome back. Um, our call to confession throughout Advent is the same coming from uh, John the Baptist. Prepare the way of the Lord. So let us make our confession to God using the prayer of confession now on your screen. O oh, promised Christ. We are a world at war. Our peace depends on your coming. We are a sinful people. Our pardon depends on your coming. We are full of good intentions, but weak at keeping promises. Our only hope of doing God's will is that you should come and help us do it.
Amen. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. People of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, whose coming we announce in this season is our righteousness. In Christ, we are made right with God. Thanks be to God. Now let us sing the peace we find in our salvation using the Advent doxology. Our children's focus for today uses the Advent devotional that Ashlyn created for the children of this church and will be led by Tracy Kosky as she and her boys, Noah and Nathan, read and engage today's devotional together. It was tempting to unmute microphones and try to have some interaction here if there were other kids on the call, but that would also very likely become a little chaotic. So... <laughs> So I'm hoping that Tracy will start a conversation about today's devotional reading that all the kids and their parents continue after worship is over. Tracy, over to you. Thanks, Pastor Jeff. Good morning and from our house to yours and happy holidays. Um, the boys and I hope you each have great big smiles on your faces and happiness in your hearts this morning. And we look forward to seeing those smiles in person soon. I have a question for the kiddos or any adults who might want to partake to think about, and maybe later you can talk about it uh, with your parents. What does it mean to be courageous, to be brave? Can you think of a time when you were really, really brave? And I know you guys, so I bet you can. Can you think of a time when you saw someone else be really, really brave? I bet you can. Well, Joshua chapter one, verse six, reminds us to be strong and courageous. Nathan, can you read that verse for us? Sure. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, Psalm 40 reminds us to be patient when we reach out to the Lord. We may not understand why something is happening, but we must always remember, guys, that God hears our prayers. God hears our fears, and he believes in us. We should always remind others of God's good, goodness, too. Sometimes being patient when we really wanted God to help us take some courage and finding that peace that Ashlyn talked about earlier it, um, takes patience and courage as well. Um, I've thought a lot about courage here lately. I've seen courage in my own mom as she goes through a long and hard sickness, but remains so strong, so positive, so patient, so faithful. I've seen courage in all the doctors and nurses and first responders, other frontline workers, who are out there every day doing their jobs during COVID. 
I've seen courage in others who do the right thing, even when others may not be, who stand up for others, their friends, their family, strangers, um, or stand up for what, for what they believe. Okay, kiddos, speaking of courage, there's a story I want to share with you today about two courageous women, Esther and Pocahontas. If you have your awesome Disney Christmas Book of Devotions, turn to number 20 and follow along, please, as I share the story. And it's the green page with number 20 at the top. Okay, here goes. Pocahontas was going about her daily life when suddenly everything changed with the arrival of a ship. Esther was going about her life when suddenly everything changed and she became King Xerxes' wife. Although both women were faced with a new, unknown experience, instead of running away or complaining, they face that new challenge with grace and strength and courage. Pocahontas befriended John Smith and showed him her world, even while many of her people were afraid of those newcomers. The Bible says in Hebrews that we should show hospitality to strangers in need, and Pocahontas did just that. But not everyone that came on the ship was as kind or as gentle as John Smith. Some people, like Governor Radcliffe, had only one goal in mind. He wanted gold and was willing to do anything to get it. He only saw Pocahontas' people as a threat because he thought they were hiding the gold from him. His greed and prejudice caused a lot of problems. Likewise, in Esther's story in the Bible, a man named Haman was greedy for more power. He cared a lot about his public image and tried to do things that got the king's attention. When the king publicly honored and celebrated Esther's cousin, Mordecai, instead of him, Haman became very jealous. Just like Governor Radcliffe, he was willing to do anything to get what he wanted. When Esther found out about Haman's plan, she was really scared if she demanded to see the king and ask him to help her without, without being summoned, she could get in trouble herself. She could have chosen not to act to let Haman carry out his plan. Pocahontas could have chosen not to act and people would have been harmed too. However, Esther and Pocahontas were both willing to risk their own lives in order to save their people. In the end, it was Haman and Governor Ratcliffe who had to face the consequences for their greed, selfishness, and hatred. Kiddos, always remember that doing the right thing isn't always easy. The superheroes come in all shapes and sizes and, and types. Loving others more than ourselves takes a lot of courage too. Thanks for listening to the story today about how God helped Esther and Pocahontas to be brave. Always remember that God can help all of us be brave and find our own superhero capes too. And now let's bow our heads and say a quick prayer. Dear Lord, when we are faced with situations that require us to show courage, please help us to remember you are listening and you do believe in us. Please be with us as we try to help others be brave during trying times as well. And thank you for continuing to spread your light and love within the hearts and homes of our church family and beyond. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. Amen. And thank you, Tracy and Noah and Nathan for, for sharing that. As we prepare to, to hear the, the word read and proclaimed, let us pray our prayer for illumination together. Gracious God, sometimes we see your hand in little events, and sometimes we see it in the broad sweep of history. Stir our hearts that we might be people of hope, Help us seek you in your word, 
and keep us from growing weary as we wait, that we may not miss the glory of your appearing. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. This week, we have just one reading, a gospel reading from Matthew 1, 18 to 25, and, that, and this reading focuses on the life of Joseph. Much gratitude to our reader this morning, pastoral assistant extraordinaire, Dick Mickley. Thanks, Pastor Jeff. I'm glad to see all the faces out there that are worshiping with us. It's a joy to see them instead of knowing that they're out there someplace. Matthew opens up his book showing the connection with the Hebrews of old, the fathers. And there's three sets of 14 where he tra traces Abraham to David, from David to the exile, and from the return of the ex from the exile to the Messiah. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his merry mother had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are, you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God with us. And when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she, be, till she born a son. And he named him Jesus, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, thank you, Dick. So, uh, our second Christmas movie in this sermon series, Advent at uh, the Movies, is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And it begins with Clark Griswold, patriarch and provider that he fancies himself to be, declaring the thesis to this year's Christmas. We're going to have a fun, old-fashioned family Christmas. This pronouncement is made as it punctuates the family singing Christmas carols on their drive out of the suburbs and into the great white wild where they will find and cut down their own Christmas tree. Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, loves this part of the movie. In fact, I think Joseph models himself a lot after Clark Griswold, and both of them are reminiscent of of one of my favorite July for King songs titled Normal Life that has this chorus. Now, I just want to live a normal life, get a fast car and a pretty wife. We could have children of our own settle down here until they're grown. Do you want to live a normal life with me? When Joseph proposed to Mary, you can almost imagine that he had that song playing in the background. He was likely still a young man, though slightly older than Mary. He's got a good trade as a carpenter, and he's going to get a pretty wife. He's been saving up for a fast camel, though he knows he'll be pressured to sell it for the four-donkey model when baby comes along a few years from now. He's going to be a good family man, work to provide, teach and nurture his children, coach Little League and, and uh, scare away the, the monsters when they creep into late night imaginations. He'll teach his children the faith, 
of a God who has chosen them to be elect among all the nations of the world, and he will grow in stature and standing in the local synagogue. One day he'll be an elder and will provide paternal care for the entire community. But for now, he's just going to take the first steps of such faithful ambitions. He'll marry Mary and entrust the rest to God. But that's the rub. For saying things like entrust the rest to God is often predicated upon the presumption that God will do what God has always done. It is a statement of security and stability. And while no one can deny that trusting God is a statement of security, both temporal and eternal, there is no reason to assume stability. In fact, following God is often a very destabilizing act of faith. As we watch the comedy of National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation unfold, it's important to keep two key insights in mind. First, this is a slapstick comedy that has been clearly influenced by the Three Stooges. Comedy's archaeology has three main points of origins, at least in contemporary American society. Slapstick uh, uh, with the Three Stooges, Verbal Wit with the Marx Brothers, and the Buddy Comedy with Abbott and Costello. Watch any comedy today and you're watching one of those three versions. But I'm going to ask us to read the slapstick more deeply than just the physical antics necessary to evoke a chuckle. I'm, I'm asking this because of our second point. This movie is satire. It is, after all, part of the National Lampoon Empire, and to lampoon something is to publicly criticize someone or something by using ridicule, ridicule, irony, or sarcasm. What this means, and this is an important point without which this entire sermon makes no sense, what this means is that Clark Griswold is not the hero of this movie. In fact, he's an anti-hero. Clark represents nostalgia run amok. Maybe the most poignant scene that represents this comes when he finds himself accidentally trapped in the attic. In order to stay warm, he starts to root around in old boxes and chests and where he does discover some gaudy old clothing, clearly last worn by some departed grandmother. But he also discovers old real to real videos of his childhood Christmas. And so we find Clark literally wrapped in old clothes while he watches old videos, all with tears streaming down his cheek. These videos and the memories they contain are the manifestation of a fun old fashioned family Christmas. And what Clark explicitly states he desires when he tells his, when he tells Ellen, his wife, all my life, I've wanted to have a big family Christmas. Of course, importantly, this nostalgia drenched scene ends when Ellen returns home, pulls down the ladder to the attic, and Clark, who had been sitting on that ladder, falls to the ground. Clark's nostalgia is at its apex when the ground is literally pulled out from underneath him. That must have been what Joseph felt like after he discovered that Mary was pregnant. You see, Joseph's dream of a normal life did not involve marrying a woman with a past paramour. All of a sudden, once her pregnancy is known, Joseph has the floor pulled out from underneath him and he falls into a crumpled heap. Our reading today picks up with Joseph still laying in that broken heap and pondering what to do. Ultimately, he decides, because he's a good man, just like Clark Griswold, who is called the last true family man by his co-worker Bill. Ultimately, though, Joseph decides that he will just release Mary quietly from her betrothment and then figure things out. 
having settled that matter, at least logistically, if not emotionally, he falls asleep, only to find his slumber punctuated not by the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, but by none other than the angel of the Lord. The angel brings with him a radical command. Marry the woman, raise the son, oh, and make sure you name him Jesus, for he is the fulfillment of prophecies given long ago. Like I said earlier, we may get a lot, of, a lot of security out of trusting God, but we don't always get much in the way of stability. This year's Christmas is going to be an unstable affair. We know that already. The inevitable spike in COVID cases from Thanksgiving travel. On the Sunday before Thanksgiving, the TSA reported that more than a million air passengers uh, flew for the first time since mid-March, meaning we will see greater spread of SARS-CoV-2. This spike will likely result in even greater restrictions on Christmas. This means that if you're filling your hearts with a fun, old-fashioned family Christmas hope right now, you'll likely find yourself crumpled in a heap when the floor falls out from underneath you. So I wanna caution you against entrusting such hopes, but not only because I don't want anyone to be disappointed. No, I caution against such hopes because time and time again, we've learned that dashed hopes almost always result in violence. This is most certainly true for Clark Griswold, his fun, old-fashioned ambitions frequently lead to physical pain and violence against himself, Aunt Bethany's cat, Santa and his reindeer lawn decorations, his next-door neighbors, uh, Todd and Margot Chester, Uncle Lewis's toupee, and just about every window and door jam in the entire house. The violence crescendos when Cousin Eddie kidnaps Clark's boss and, per Clark's wild rantings request, delivers him to the homestead in chains with a bow, which itself then leads to a SWAT team raid of the family home. In the midst of this chaos, as, as family members are saying, well, Christmas is about over, I think we'll head home now, Clark yells at his family, nobody's leaving. We're gonna have a fun old fashioned family Christmas. That which began the film as the thesis is now uttered near the end of the film as a threat. Now, I know all this violence is played to comedic effect per the rules of slapstick, slapstick comedy. But if we read that slapstick more deeply, maybe more seriously, we see that deferred dreams and broken hopes often result in violence. In fact, it might just be that slapstick is a comedic way of expressing disappointment. After all, the violence of this past summer in city streets across the country was of the same character as this disappointment turned destruction. And Clark Griswold is no three-dimensional character, but rather represents a piece of every one of us, a piece that significantly gets lampooned. We are, if we take this comedic film seriously, supposed to understand that receiving the blessing of this season involves just that, an act of reception, not self-deception. But wasn't that really Joseph's downfall? He had these noble dreams and ambitions, but he sought to set out and create them uh, rather than receive them. He was so creation-oriented that he even that even when God gave him the gift of all gifts, the very savior that the prophets had foretold, Joseph, Joseph's mind turns to how this uh, is but an impediment to the blessings he seeks for himself. It takes nothing short of an angelic visit in order for him to get his mind right, in order to keep him from doing violence against Mary, and to be sure, Violence is on the table. Joseph's scheme to divorce her quiet, he schemes to divorce her quietly precisely because an unmarried pregnant woman could be stoned to death for this indiscretion. 
what is an ethical conundrum for Joseph is nothing less than an existential crisis for Mary. And this is why then I urge us to avoid entertaining false hopes and nostalgic dreams. All reasonable and faithful indications are that such aspirations are bound to leave us broken and seething, that is, broken and seeking to break something. It is not unintentional that we lit the peace candle this week and that our prayer of confession had us admit we are a world at war. Violent responses to bitter disappointment are common, and this is liable to be a season of bitter disappointments. Except for this. Jesus is still coming into the world. God is still Emmanuel, God with us. This is a truth that remains secure even as it destabilizes. And this is what makes Clark Griswold a cautionary tale and Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, a near role model for us. I say near role model because Joseph does awake from his angelic dream and he does do what the Lord requires of him, just like we'd expect from a man with such faithful expectations for himself. But I find it significant that when Mary receives this news, news that compromises not just her aspirations, but her very bodily integrity, Mary is both frightened and delighted. Mary's Annunciation concludes with a Magnificat, a song to God's glory and goodness. Joseph's Annunciation concludes with just rigorous duty and not much else. This Christmas, and this may be true of all Christmases, even those not lived under the dark cloud of COVID, is a bit of a discipleship litmus test. If we succumb to the nostalgia, the temptation of nostalgia, we will have the floor pulled out from underneath us and we'll find ourselves confronted with the ethical challenges of what to do with our disappointment, the sort of disappointment Joseph must have felt when he learned his fiance was pregnant. In, in this event, peace will feel almost as if a pipe dream. If, however, we seek to transform our disposition, maybe even more appropriately, ask God to transform our dispositions. We will find ourselves able to receive blessings, not of our own handiwork, and to accept gifts that we didn't even have the good sense to put on our list to Santa. For in the end, God is still good and God is with us. Nothing is going to take these facts away. But if we fill the eyes of our heart with dollops of nostalgia punctuated by poolside fantasies, no matter what God gives us, we'll only ever be able to receive it as a Jelly of the Month Club subscription. I realize that's a lot of fancy language without any practical plan for how to partner with God in the transformation of our dispositions. But that's just the best I have to offer because each of us are faced with the same spiritual challenges, but that are unique to our own situations. For example, the disappointments of a family of four not being able to travel to see their out-of-state out grandparents is real, but it's still of a different quality and character than the disappointments of a widow or widower unsure if anyone is going to be with them on Christmas. All are, of course, victims of this cruel plague, but not all victimhood is the same. And so, the best offer, the best I can offer is to change the narrative. Change the narrative in your life right now if you need to. From that of victim of a plague to participant in a cure. From disappointed into what isn't happening to delighted in what is happening. Clark and Joseph both exist in their own ways as cautionary tales of what not to do, but they offer us very little in what to do. And so let me recommend this. Maybe this is the year that we all re-engage the tradition of the 12 days of Christmas, which is a, a, a church created 
tradition of a, a 12 day feast season in the life of the church between Christ's birth and epiphany. The 12 days of Christmas offers us not one big morning of gifts galore, of, of tearing paper and screams and shouts of delight, but rather a slow and steady unveiling of gift after gift after gift, which will allow us to cherish even the small things. Small things like just setting aside time uh, uh, on a day to play a game with our family, or maybe even play with out-of-town friends through the internet. Bree and I have had a great time playing on a platform called Board Game Arena. Email me later if you want to know more about that. It has allowed us to do game nights with friends both near and far. Small things like dedicating one day to enjoying your favorite cocktail or mocktail. The purpose of the 12 days of Christmas is to receive even the small blessings with big gratitude. And significantly, in that song, each day's gift is repeated again and again. I don't think you receive the gift again and again, but it's remembered again and again. We don't just consume the gift of the first day of Christmas and then leave it behind. No, we begin the second day of Christmas by reflecting on the true on the gift that our true love gave us on the day before. And maybe that's a model to follow for such an interrupted and unstable year. I'm honestly not sure because I'm stuck in this same struggle as everyone else. But I do cling and can cling to the sure fact that God is with us. And that has always been enough. Indeed, it is even better than a fun, old-fashioned family Christmas. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us affirm what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed which I will bring up in another clunky transition. Oh, geez. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Having been united in a shared affirmation, let us continue in that unity by praying together. Let us pray. Holy God, we build up our dreams for this season dreams of a fun old-fashioned family Christmas, but we do not ask your dreams for our families. Forgive us. Enlarge our hearts to see family appear wherever two or more are gathered in your name. Enlarge our souls to see family appear whenever we are present with you in prayer and worship. Do not let our nostalgia change us, chain us to the past when the entire point of your coming is to give us a future. Lord, when we look to the short-term future, we are concerned. We see spiking infections, overflowing hospitals, and cemeteries with too many fresh mounds of dirt in them. We see loved ones coughing and shaking with chills. We see out-of-town loved ones still out of town over the holidays. Lord, we need you. We need you to strike down this pandemic. We need you to raise up our spirits. 
We need you to give us the courage to do the right thing, not the selfish or nostalgic things, now and always. And Father, we pray for those who are sick with COVID. We lift up AJ and Amanda and their entire family. We lift up other members of our congregation who are sick. We remember one who is in the hospital. We pray your healing on their lives. And not just their lives, but the lives of all those in our community, our state, our nation, and around the world. Let their healing be an extension of your coming into the world. Through this healing, let the whole world know just who its Lord and Savior and friend is. Come, Lord, come. Lord, we are entrusting ourselves to you. We give ourselves over to you, just like you, in your incarnation, gave yourself over for us. And so, Lord, we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us remain in a posture of prayer as we pray for our military and first responders. This week's military prayer will be led by Kevin Crosswaite. Kevin, over to you. Grace to you and peace. This military prayer was prepared for Peace Candle Sunday. Some of you may feel that is a dichotomy. I have a military prayer on Peace Sunday because the business of the military is war. However, if the military has a reputation for being effective in their training and their equipment, they can often deter war. Even Jesus recognized this when he spoke in Luke chapter 14, verse 31. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms. Similarly, Police officers can, by their own presence, deter crime and violence, becoming truly peace officers. Please pray with me. Dear Lord and Father of us all, please be with our military and police as they strive to deter conflict and violence. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. If they still find themselves in conflict, please grant them the peace that passes under all understanding. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen, and, and thank you, Kevin. Now have time for a few announcements. Um, yeah, the uh, first announcement is next week's Advent movie is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And this one must be a popular cultural uh, story because there are three different versions out there. There's the old school cartoon version that's like a half an hour. Uh, unfortunately, you can only find that one available by purchase over different streaming services. Then there's a Jim Carrey live action version because Jim Carrey looks like he was put together by Dr. Seuss. That one is free on Netflix. And then there's a new Netflix version that stars Benedict Cumberbatch. I am gonna watch all three in preparation for this, uh, this week's sermon, this upcoming Sunday sermon. Um, and also because my wife is gonna make me watch all three. Uh, she's loving this Christmas movie thing uh, and theme. So go ahead and watch uh, any of those. There will definitely be references to each one of them. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their generosity to the Giving Tree. 
the last I checked, there were just a few options to, to support. And I even saw some emails from the mission committee that support was so robust that there's uh, some of the financial gifts that have come in uh, are even going to be able to support more children and families than we initially thought. So feel free to still hop on. And if there's any opening uh, gifts left, you can grab those through the sign up genius. Uh, and if you've already signed up, a reminder that all gifts are due, wrapped with their identifying tag one week from today, and that members of the mission committee are going to be present uh, at the church. Uh, to receive those, uh, your gifts on both uh, this upcoming Friday and Saturday. Uh, and as always, if you know you miss the opportunities to, to drop off, just call myself or anyone from the mission committee and we can make arrangements even to have gifts picked up. Yesterday, uh, the Hope Center was supposed to have uh, something like an eight hour uh, Radiothon, which was their replacement to the traditional fundraiser, Hope for the Holidays. Many of you have attended Hope for the Holidays in Christmas's past, but obviously all being crowded into a room together sharing a meal is not a COVID-friendly event this year. So they were going to do the Radiothon and hope that people would call in and, and you know, participate and give. Well, COVID struck yet again, and the radio DJ and host of this Radiothon sadly has COVID. So it was canceled. So now the Hope Center, much like us this morning with worship, is on something like Plan C, D, or M. And so I'm just coming to you, uh, yes, as a board member for the Hope Center and as your pastor, but also just as a, a community member here at Marysville. And I'm asking you to consider making some sort of gift, either one time or sustainable month by month gift to the Hope Center uh, to support them in the year to come. We, we know the good they do in Marysville and throughout Union County. That doesn't even need to be recounted here. Uh, their, their good is so well known. But in this unique season, when they've had their major annual fundraiser ripped from them, they really do need the rest of the community to come around and show them how much we know they do good and how much we value them. And finally, the session has been in a, a series of discussions about how to have some sort of safe in-person uh, worshiping experience. While we're remaining committed to our using the Ohio Public Health Advisory System for Sunday morning in-person worship, uh, and that is just as a reminder, uh, when Union County is yellow or orange, we will be in person, and all other Sundays we will be uh, doing pre-recorded worship videos or in a pinch here on Zoom. Uh, we remain committed to that, but we have heard congregants when they have, have proclaimed a desire for really two things. One, presence in a sacred space. And I think we all kind of want to get out of our own homes after nine months of being socially isolated to them. But, but access to a sacred space. So just time in the sanctuary and access uh, to Christian fellowship. Um. And so we've heard that. The session has heard that. I, as your pastor, have heard that. And so what we've come together and, and, and put together is an evening prayer service. Now, this is not a replacement to Sunday morning worship. And to show and signal as much, we're scheduling these evening prayer services every Sunday at 5 p.m., beginning next Sunday, December 13th. It is a 30 minute uh, service in a sacred space with Christian fellowship. It is gonna be largely lay led. Um, there will be a liturgy and 
lay leaders from both the session and the deacons have already agreed to step up and, and help lead this time of both public and private prayer. And so if that's something that you might be interested in, I wanted to share that evening prayer services will begin on Sunday, December 13th at 5 p.m. All other safety measures are just presumed at this point. The governor has told you wear a mask. The governor has told you socially distance from one another and wash your hands. We're not even going to be overemphasizing this anymore. Authorities uh, much larger than just small town parish pastors have told us what we need to do to be safe. And we're just going to abide by that in all faithfulness. Uh, so it should still be a, as COVID safe as a space as we can make it. One note, though, about that Christian fellowship aspect. We have no idea who will attend the this evening prayer service, who will feel safe enough, who will be comfortable um, with that sort of liturgical led prayer. And so keep that in mind. Um, uh, once again, just worried more about uh, elevated expectations and then having the floor fall out from underneath you. Oh, and if you're like, I love this idea, but I'm never going to show up while we're still like red and whatnot, there is still a way for every member of the congregation to participate. And I hope every member does. And that is, you can send prayer requests for those who are gathered to pray, pray for and pray over. If anything, it's a 30 minute prayer service. They're going to need the material, right? Uh, and you can send those prayer requests at a new email address we've just set up, prayer at fpcmarysville.com. Prayer at fpcmarysville.com. So this is a way for the entire community to participate in this evening prayer service, even if you're not planning to leave and come out. And with that, we will continue in our worship with our closing hymn. And we're gonna conclude this worship service, which I think went fairly well, right? I'm, I'm a little worried actually that the window got frozen on Dick Mickley the whole time I was preaching. And so the sermon won't have my face, but his, uh, I'm not sure. We'll find out when the, the video ends. Um, but on the whole, I think this has went very well. And, and I'm grateful for that. And so remember to keep those, mukes, uh, those mics muted, uh, but know that even though others can't hear you, God still hears you sing praises to his glory, and he is pleased by it. So let us sing our closing hymn, The First Noel. One more clunky transition. Did say, was to 
Thank you all for, for being here, uh, for continuing to show the flexibility uh, necessary to, to truly trust a God who is secure, but maybe not always stable. I pray for all of us this Advent and Christmas season that, that our expectations be formed more by the holy future that we know God is laying out for us than, than by nostalgic pasts. This is a season maybe to, to look to a much, much brighter future as a way of, of, of not lamenting what is lost, but leaning into what is coming. That is the best Advent and Christmas prayer I have for us, at least this particular year. Go now with the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit this day and all your days. Amen.